Oh, also, birthday, birthday alert. How, uh, Leon Sanders, my fourth born, let's give him a hand clap. Come up here, Leon. He's gonna be out of town next week. So he didn't know I was gonna honor him this week. And you know how we do. We, when we, it's a birthday, we try to put something in their hands. Thank you for all you do. Most time you're the first one here, last one to leave. Thank you for all you do, okay? I know sometimes you're working at the firm and your part-time job doing, what, about 60 hours a week, and you press it every Sunday. Thank God for you. Amen. I love you, and I appreciate you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, man. Well, we've been, so again, want to thank God for him. It's time for the Word. We've been dealing with a series. Y'all remember the series? We had Father's Day last week, so we dealt with homecoming. Was that an awesome message? Five reasons, get back to this, five reasons to embrace trials in your life. And if you're watching this online and you're going through something right now, know that the Lord is with you. If you're in the sanctuary and you're going through something right now, know that the Lord is with you. And you say, well, Pastor, I'm in a good place. I'm on a mountaintop right now. How many know there's valleys, there's plateaus, and there's mountaintops? You say, I'm on a plateau, I'm on a mountaintop. I'm not going through anything right now. Well, how about this? File this message away in your spiritual library because guess what? As soon as, as sure as my name is Howard K. Sanders II, you're going to have to go through something sooner or later because it's the part of life. Amen? And trials do not discriminate. They don't care what color you are, what race you are, what sex you are. <laughs> they don't care. Trials will come. It's a part of life. The Bible lets us know that. So five reasons to embrace trials in your life. Not because we're masochists. No, but because in the midst of it all, God is still in control. And if we lose sight of God's depth for our life, we lose sight of God. It's so important. Let me say that again. If we lose sight of God's depth, D-E-P-T-H, for our life, we lose sight of God. It's so important when we're going through different things that we keep our eyes and focus on God. Amen? Let's, let's get right into it. Stand to your feet for the reading of the Word. We're going to read 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. 1 Peter 4 and 12 through 19 says what? Let's read together. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners of Christ in his suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed. 14th verse. If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed, for the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. For if you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. Well, okay, that's a nice way of God saying you need to mind your business. Amen? You need to mind your business. He says, if you suffer for the wrong reasons, I'm not with you, but I'm not backing that. But if you suffer, there's some right ways that you need to suffer. Let's keep going. 16th verse. But it's no shame to suffer for being Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by His name. For the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate await those who have never obeyed God's good news? And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to the godless sinner? So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to God who created you, for He will never fail you. You may be seated if you can. That 19 verse I want to highlight. So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God. What does it say to do? Keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to the God who created you, for He will never fail you. That sort of goes on along what we went over in, 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 in leadership class. We've been reading a psalm for courage and a proverb for wisdom. And we were on Psalms 4 today. Psalm 4 today. And it was talking about looking to God in the midst of what we're going through. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you right now for every person under the sound of my voice. I thank you, God, that you're doing something in us and through us. Howard sits down. There's no way I can articulate this message in myself. Holy Spirit, 
you take over. Let me be hidden behind the cross. Anoint these lips of clay that they may declare your truth, that the hearers may hear it and be transformed from the inside out. Lord, I sit down. You rise up in me and through me. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, I just also say this, God. I, let me not be bound by this outline. Holy Spirit, help me to be sensitive to what you're saying in this hour. I lay down my own agenda and I surrender to yours, wherever that may take us. In Jesus' name and in Jesus' name, amen and amen. One thing I've learned is, you know, we can have our plans. The Bible says many are the plans of a man's heart, but God's divine purpose will prevail. Uh, you know, it's so important that when we're ministering or when we're doing something for God that we yield our plan to him. And my prayer today is that what God ultimately plans to happen will happen for this day. Amen? And how many know he will do that? Thank you for that, Brother Ace. I appreciate that. Amen? Now, there's one thing. There's always one thing I want you to get, right? How many things? One. One thing. This is, this is, this is a win-win for all of us. Amen? And here it is. I'm going to say it first. The fiery trials come to refine me in God, not to destroy me. Sounds familiar? I want by the end of this series this to be so deep in your spirit that you won't forget it. Here we go. Let's say it together. The fiery trials come to refine me in God and not to destroy me. One more time. The fiery trials come to refine me in God, not to destroy me. And they're fiery. The, 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 the mindset or the, 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 the picture that James is trying, that Peter is trying to give uh, the writer of this book is that it's fiery. It's intense. How I many know fire is intense? It's hot. Everybody say hot. I'm not talking about that weak trial that you know you can overcome. How many have ever gone through a trial where you have to call out to Jesus? I'm not talking about the ones that are easy. That, oh, I got that. I solved that in my brain in five seconds. I'm talking about when it seems like the whole world is collapsing on you. And you're getting something, you even get a headache because you start trying to think with your little pea brain. And some of you have high IQs in this room. But, in our, but our, our, with the highest IQ that we have, it's a pea brain compared to the mind of God. So we go on overload, being a computer. How many have computers where it, it'll start spinning and spinning? I don't care how much RAM you have and how much ROM you have. At some point, every computer begins to spin because it's man-made. And guess what? Your brain will somehow begin to spin and say overload, overload, like the hourglass is just turning and turning and turning and turning and you reboot and it's still turning and turning and turning and you have to come to a point of surrender. You say, God, I just give it to you. Church, I would like to say to you that sometimes when I've been going through trials or even some of you may be going through trials and I don't have the answer, I've had to go in prayer and say, Lord, I don't know what to say. I know what theologically I was taught to say. But sometimes those answers don't fit the situation. Are you with me? Sometimes the words seem so shallow. You're going through and I'm saying, I, I know there's goodness coming. You're like, Pastor, I know that. But what about now? That's the time when we have to give it back to him. Surrender. And in our surrender, begin to see pic the big picture of God. You know? Leon, come up here for a second. Some of y'all remember we did this analogy. I want to do it again. Remember, I don't know if I used him, but come on up here, birthday boy. We'll use you today in your Braves outfit. Turn around so they can see. We'll get you over here for the camera. Is this, are we still in the camera? Okay, so... Just like this, we said when that issue or that trial comes, it begins to block our view. And as we, we said, a, a good way to come into surrender is one is to get beneath the problem. You remember what we did? You have to take those, but take those knees. Go ahead and get, to, how many know bowing is a, a way of surrendering? Now look, look, now you're under, but look, before when he was, stand, stand back up, I mean, it's going to be an exercise today. 
you're in good shape. Guess what? Look up and what do you see? <laughs> that problem's still there, right? Okay, sit down, get, the, get on the knees. When we humble ourselves, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, it says in First Peter. Now look up. Not only do you see the problem, but the problem looks much smaller when you look at God's majesty. See, I like praying at night so that I'm just going outside when I'm dealing with something or early in the morning and just looking up at the sky and talk to God. I know he's with me and in me, but I see the vastness of who God is and realize my problem is so small compared to one of the largest stars that are out there. And if God is controlling all of that, he can control my situation. And I can give it to him. Are y'all with me? I like going to the beach and getting on my knees. Stay right there. Get on my knees. See how you're ready to get up? So now we want to get up and it's time to stay down. Turn your neighbor and say, stay down. Stay in that place of surrender. I love going to the beach. I'm not a beach person. My wife is a beach person. I'm a mountain person. I like going to that. But I'll, I'll talk about the beach right now. When I, when I am willingly dragged to the beach, because I love my wife of 26 years. My favorite thing is getting up at five in the morning and sneaking out there. I don't like to be out in the sun. I like to see when the sun rises. And it seems like everybody that's out there at five are like the nicest people. That's my opinion. And we're all looking at the same thing. And I watch the sun rise over God's bath bathtub. I call it God's big bathtub. And I go out there and I pray and I pray for my family I pray for my kids. I pray for you all. And all of the issues that I'm facing seem so small to God's bathtub. And it puts it all in perspective. The same way when I go to the mountain, I like getting up at 5 in the morning then. I think usually 5.30 it rises when I'm up in Pigeon Forge or Cyberville. And I like, we usually get a, a cottage right on the top. My wife said, why you I like going on the top, top? where we have to just drive up. And everybody's like, woo! So that I can get on that balcony in the morning on that third floor and sit out there and talk to the Lord and watch and talk, look at and see God's glory over the trees and over the mountains and see the clouds the, 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 the begin to dissipate when the sun hits them. It's just amazing to me. Thank you so much. Give him a hand clap. Amen. And that's what I did even when my pat dad passed. We had already had a mountain trip. So the day after we arranged all his funeral arrangements, we took off to the mountains. And we had to get back for the funeral. And in the midst, even though I was hurting, I could get up early in the morning and have that time with the Lord and, and, and surrender the situation to God. Lord, you're going to take us through this. You're going to give me the, you're going to help me deliver this eulogy. God had given me the eulogy days before, the week, weekend before Father's Day, because he died on Memorial Day, and I didn't realize it. But God had prepped me for it. I, what am I talking about? I'm talking about surrender. Times in my life where I had to surrender in the midst of my pain and my trial. Amen? Hopefully that was helpful you, for, to you, because where there is no struggle, there is no strength. And what God is trying to build in us is strength in our walk. Amen? He's trying to build spiritual muscle. He says, I want you strong in me. Amen? And trials are the monkey bars of our faith. Let me say it again. Trials are the monkey bars of our faith. They are the, 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 um, the, the, the cardio. They are the, the weights, uh, you know, the nautical machines of our faith. Amen? I want to talk to you about five reasons for God's people to rejoice in suffering. Five reasons for God's people to rejoice in suffering. I gave you four, and we stopped around four, so I'm going to revisit four, and then we'll go into five if we have time. If not, we may just stop at four, whatever the Holy Spirit has, and I'll do the fifth one next week. Amen? First one is this. We are in Christ, God's beloved. That's one reason to rejoice, because we are in Christ, God's beloved, and suffering does not mean that we are not God's beloved. Suffering does not mean that we're not God's beloved. Amen? Everybody remember that? We're in Christ. Secondly, our Savior has a leash and collar on all of our suffering. 
Our Savior has a leash. If you can imagine a pet, we had a pet dog, a pet rabbit, and we had a rabbit leash and a, rabbit and a dog leash. Well, God has a leash on your suffering. Amen? It only can take you, but it only can go but so far. And you, can, you say, well, pastor, how is that biblical? Look at the first chapter of Job in your study time. You'll see that Satan had to go to God to say, can I touch your servant Job? And God says, yeah, you can touch him. I'll take the hedge down, but you can't kill him. And he says, it's going to bring glory out of him. Satan said, no, it's going to make him deny you. God says, nah, this is my servant. Are y'all with me? Our suffering is serving the Father, God, and therefore us. It's making us better, not bitter. Let me say that again. Say, how about say this with me? My suffering, our suffering is making us better, not bitter. I declare it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hopefully you're saying this with me at home. And go ahead and write that in the comment section. Interact with me while we're sharing here. Amen. Thirdly, all who share in Jesus' suffering share in Jesus' glory. Let me say that again. All who share in Jesus' suffering share in Jesus' glory. Our suffering breeds God's glory. Our suffering creates God's glory. Your suffering are, are glory makers. Because people get to see the glory of God that's in your life. How many want to be used for God? Raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Raise your hand. At home, if you want to be used for God, you've prayed the prayer, Lord, use me. I know when I first got saved, that was my prayer. I said, Lord, use me. Guess what? Well, if you want God to use you, there's going to be some trials that come. That's part of him using you. And I used to pray the prayer all the time. How many know I realized I didn't have to pray that prayer that he was going to do it anyway if I'm in him? But I used to pray, Lord, whatever it is, I don't care, use me. If I have to go through, use me. I, see, when I, I was like 17 when I got saved. Just cry out to him. And guess what he did, amen? So I shouldn't be surprised when it happened. Fourthly, those who cause your suffering will not be able to withstand God's furious judgment. See, that's why it's understanding that vengeance is his and not yours, because those who cause your suffering will not be able to withstand God's furious judgment. You don't have to take it on your own. Amen? Look again at verses four, uh, 1 Peter 4, 16 through 18. We're going to hit this real quickly because it's a review. But if anyone is ill-treated and suffers as Christians, which is contemptuously called, let him not be what? But give what? Glory. Give what? Give glory to who? Do you glorify the situation? Say, I'm going through. Oh, that bad devil. I mean, I hear people talk about the devil sometimes in their testimony. They talk about the devil like he's God. You know that devil? He just beat us up. Oh, slew foot. I mean, I've been to testimony service where they talk about the devil so much. I'm like, is this about Jesus getting glory or is this about God getting glory? Amen. The testimony is there was a test and then God brought me through and he brought me through marvelously. I may have been kicking and screaming, but he brought me through instead. I may have lost hope, but God brought me through. And it shows not that I'm faithful, that he's faithful in the midst of it all. Amen. Or I may have been in faith the whole time, but he brought me through. The emphasis is not on me. It's not on Satan. It's on God bringing us through. And sometimes we make it about us. And guess what? When you make it about us or you or me, guess what? God says, okay, they got to go through that again because they didn't get the lesson. The lesson is I'm trying to get the enemies out of the inner me. God will deliver you from your enemies, not your friends. When you make that inner me your friend, that thing that God's trying to get out of you in the midst of the trial, you make it about you, he says, you got to go through. You got to go through. But if you make it about him and what he's doing in you and through you, guess what? You literally can come out. Are y'all with me? 17th verse, for the time has arrived for what? Judgment to begin with the household of God. We like to always talk about how God's judging the world, but God says, judge yourselves that you won't be judged. He always starts with his church. Amen? And if it begins with us, what will be the end of those who do not respect or believe or obey good, 
news of the gospel of God. So we don't need to be worrying about what sinners aren't doing. Amen. Sinners, repeat this up. Sinners are going to be sinners. <laughs> it amazes me when people are shocked by what sinners do. Because sinners are going to be sinners. But saints should be saints. Christians should be Christians, should be Christ followers. We are called to raise the standard. Amen. We are called to live a certain way according to the word of God. Does that make sense? Now here's, here's another shock. We all are sinners saved by grace. So we should not always be ex <laughs> caught off guard when we see someone that's saying they're a Christian and they're not always acting like a Christian. Because guess what? In the base of it all, it's one decision that separates us all from being sinners. And that's that decision to serve God. Just say, La, think about that a little bit. Understand this. In verse 17, it brings us back to the idea that was in verse 12. These trials, even though they are coming through unbelievers are being what? Used of God to test, to prove, and to purify. Three things that God's doing through the trial, he's testing us. He's proving us. And he's purifying us. Are you with me? One thing I did after I gave my, bought my ring for my wife, not only did I take the jeweler's word, word for it, when I bought her engagement ring 27 years ago, I went and got it, went to another jeweler and let them test to make sure it was the clarity that, they, that I was told because I wanted to go through the test before I gave it to her. Are y'all with me? I wanted a second opinion. Are you with me? Good things can, are, when you have something good, it can be tested. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you're good. And that's why God tests you. Amen? He knows that you will pass the test. Look at that next verse, the 18th verse. If the righteous are barely saved, that will become the, what will become of the godless and the wicked. Understand this, judgment begins with the house of God with Christians. In other words, to prove out who is really of the house of God and purify the house of God. That's one of the things God is doing through suffering is when, when, he, when he touches us to become church. He's proving out, this is what he's proving out. He's proving out our genuineness and purifying us. He's proving out who is his and who is not. I know some people go through tests and they backslide. They leave the faith. Are you with me? Guess what? He's showing who's going to stand and who's not going to stand. Who's going to be dependable. And he's purifying his own. To the Lord, I'm yours and you're mine. Amen? Understand this. If you notice in verse 18, you are doing after Peter. Okay, let me, I'm going to skip that part right here. I'm going to get to Romans 12 and 19. This is so important to remember when you're going through. I really don't realize, think that, I think a stat showed that anywhere from 85 to 90 percent of clergy in America do not have the true understanding of the love of God. I think when it came to Christians in America, the Bonner Research Institute, which is the largest one for Christians, I think it was even like in the high 90s that the average Christian didn't understand the love of God. So you can surmise that if the clergy don't understand it, and they're teaching every week, that we're teaching a performance-based gospel. Do you understand the danger of teaching a performance-based gospel when the gospel is based on grace? And I think our tendency to go performance-based is because we're human. In, in our intellect, the love of God just doesn't make sense to us. Just like a mother's love or a father's love doesn't make sense to us. How a mom can, you know, a mom will love her child through anything. Are you with me? I mean, I've seen film uh, on, in news where the, mom, the, 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 the son may have just killed five people. And they interview the mom and says, Mom, he's really a good boy. Because in that mom's heart, 
she can see the goodness in that little boy inside her child, no matter how wicked the world may think they, that person is. And that's, to me, a symbol of how, what God's love is. No matter how wicked the world thinks anybody is, he always sees his love in us. He always sees his grace. He sees in the midst of darkness, he sees that little light, and then he pulls it out. Are y'all with me? And I don't know about you all, but the older I am, plus 30 plus years in the faith, if I say 41, actually, I, would, I, I have to go back and look at it and say, Lord, I'm still growing in the love of God. Because something in the natural, my engineering mindset, my, my uh, uh, counting mindset that my dad gave me has a debits and credits. And I feel like I have to get so many credits to earn this thing sometimes. When God says you can't earn it, it's all about him. Are y'all with me? Now, why is that all, all important? Because when you realize how special you are to God. Now, mom and dad, those of you, if you have children, raise your hand. Think about how you are when somebody messes with your child. You can be the nicest person in the world. Some of y'all are so sweet and nice, but let somebody talk to your child wrong. What, what, so what happens? Talk to me. I want y'all to talk. This is for me. What happens when somebody, when you see, you can be the sweetest person. Some of you that are sweet, raise your hand. What happens when somebody talks to your child wrong? Come on, talk to me. The instinct to protect. What else? She being nice. What? You got what? You got to get them straight. What else? You're willing to risk yourself. You don't care about what the consequences so that it can be made right. Anybody else? You said what? Okay, that's the solution. But I'm asking, what is the emotion you feel in that moment? So, are you willing, do you feel, I know we should step away. Because I, I coach sports, and I've seen mamas, if they think I talk to their child wrong on the basketball team, and I see the sweetest person, they'll be, a coach, I need to talk to you. Yeah, I, I, yeah they're going to, I'll be like, wait a minute, okay, I, I just told them. Right. The fire is coming. Go ahead. What, you, what, how, you had your hand up, Michelle, or you just rubbing your Okay, okay. Anger, right. Now, if you get angry about that and about your child, how do you think God gets when he sees, sees somebody messing with his child? Now, when you get in the way and say, I got to take care of it, God has to get out of the way. Because the Holy Spirit's a gentleman. Okay, he says, you, oh, you got, that's why he says this, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but what? Lead the way open for God's wrath. That means you can close the door of God's wrath. Okay, did, did you get this? For it is written, vengeance is what? And I will repay requite, says the Lord. This is another way of telling us what? that we don't need to be in the business of vengeance against those who hate us. God will take care of them. And I'm telling you this, this is what I found. When people have done me wrong, when I try to take it, <laughs> try to alert people about it, it seems like more people are drawn to, to, uh, to take up for the mess. But when I sit back and let God handle it, he says, like, oh, Lord, I pray for mercy. That's why it says pray for those that despitefully use you because God says, now I'm going to handle it. You've got out of the way, now I'm going to handle it. Amen? Are y'all getting something out of that? You know what? I'm going to end it right there. We're going to deal with the fifth one next week because it's so important. Amen? So here, I hope, I hope you got these points. I hope you got them. The biggest one that stands out to me is everything that we go through in life is God filter. God is in control. Next week, we're going to be done with the sovereignty of God. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. Because this is the most important point to remember of all things. This is the one that keeps me. It's the last point to me, but it's one of the most powerful points. God is sovereign and he's faithful. You can't see. If, if, you, don't under, if you understand his sovereignty, but you don't understand his faithfulness, you think he's a mean ruler. 
And if you know he's faithful and you don't realize that he's sovereign, you think that he's just not in control, but he's there. But he's sovereign and he's faithful. So next week, we're going to unpack that a little bit more and look at what it means to be a child of God in, under his sovereignty. And, and, and guess what? An object of his faithfulness. A subject of his sovereignty and an object of his faithful love toward us. Amen? But the one thing we got to remember, and we'll get to that. Who remembers what the one thing was? One more time. Say it together. Trials come to refine me in God, not to destroy me. The fiery trials come to refine me in God, not to destroy me. Stand to your feet, everybody that can. You may be seated if you can't get up. Father, we just thank you right now for every person under the sound of my voice. I thank you that, um, God, you're taking us deeper. You're giving us a deeper revelation of who you are in the midst of the pain that we're going through. I pray for that person that may be listening, God, that may be smiling on the, on the outside, but on the inside there's all type of situations that are happening right now in their family, on their job, in their careers, God, in their businesses. God, you're, 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 they're experiencing fiery trials. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would not only meet them with this word, but Lord, Holy Spirit, you would comfort them beyond what any man could comfort them. Let them know that you are there for them, that God, that you love them, and that the peace of God reigns upon them. Let them know that you care. I pray that, God, you would bring a new surrender in our lives. If you're here and you're saying, Lord, I passed the, what you shared today, it touched some errors of my heart. And there's areas that I need to be surrendered. Just go ahead and put your hands up to God. I'm going to put up both hands because even though I prepared this message, as I hear it again, I know that there's new areas of my life that need surrender. And I realize just because I'm in the pulpit and I'm a pastor doesn't mean that I ever get too big where I don't need an altar. Every believer needs an altar. If you're here and you're watching us online, you say, I don't know God and I want God to be first in my life, you can pray this prayer with us as well. It's just a prayer of surrender. We're going to ask God to come into our lives and take control. And that's all salvation is. It's saying, Lord, you are Lord and you are Savior. I can't do this in myself. So pray this prayer with me. Say, dear Lord, I surrender all to you. Jesus, take control. I'm tired of trying to fix it on my own. And I give the situations, the problems, I give it to you, Lord. Guide me, Lord, in the midst of what I'm going through. And give me your heart. Allow the joy of the Lord to come upon me. In Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Give God some praise. Two things. If you prayed that with your mind and your heart, you are a new believer in Christ. You are restored in Christ because God wants us to serve him with our heart and our mind. But here's the beautiful thing. You don't have to wait to Sunday to do this. You can do this every day. Set a new altar and say, Lord, I commit this day unto you. I love you, God. Give God another hand clap. Amen. It's time to give back to God. Three things we want to remember when we give. What's the first thing? God, church is our source and our supply. If you're giving online, you can go to www.becomechurch.com. want to give you a chance to give as well. What's the second thing? Bring your seed to Jesus. 
Sow it by faith and release it by faith. What's the third thing? Follow the instruction of the Holy Spirit. Just real quickly say, Holy Spirit, what do you want to give? What do you want me to give? What shall I render? Again, you can go to becomechurch.com, click on the giving line, and you can give toward become. We're going to say our declarations to him. Are y'all ready? As we receive today's offering, we are believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commission, favorable settlements, estates and inheritance, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, debts paid off, expenses decrease, and blessings and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all my financial needs that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! I am filled with the knowledge of God's will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. His will is my prosperity. God delights in my prosperity. He gives me the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant in the earth, and I immediately respond in faith to the guidance of the Holy Spirit within me. I'm always in the right place at the right time because my steps are ordered of the Lord. God has given me all things that pertain to life and godliness, and I'm well able to possess all that God has provided for me. God is the unfailing, unlimited source of my supply. My financial income now increases as the blessings of the Lord overtake me. As I give, it is given unto me. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I honor the Lord of my substance and the first fruits of my increase. My barns are filled with plenty, and my press is burst forth with new wine. I'm like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I bring forth fruit in my season. My leaf shall not wither, and whatever I do will prosper. The grace of God even makes my mistakes to prosper. I am blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed coming in and blessed going out. I'm blessed in the basket and blessed in the store. My bank accounts, investment, health, and relations flourish. The blessing of the Lord overtakes me in all areas of my life. The blessing of the Lord makes me truly rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Hold your seat up, Father. We just thank you right now for this seed of money, of dinero. We give into your kingdom. We say cause the tithe, cause the offering, cause this little to become much as we place it in your hands. Thank you for all of our bills being paid for this house of Become Church. In Jesus' name, Lord, I also pray that your blessings will be on all those that give a hundredfold, a thousandfold return in Jesus' name and in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may bring your seed to the offering baskets. Amen. Hallelujah. Upcoming this week, again, we got a birthday. We got Kamaria's and Leon's. We got Leroy, Stella, William Gordon, happy birthday. Women's meeting every second Saturday. Men's meeting third Saturdays at 1 p.m. at Panera Bread. Morning prayer every morning, 605-475-2090. It's a telephone conference call. Access code 975-1863, Tuesday through Thursday. Bring your prayer list, your prayer requests. We call out everybody's name before the Lord. You can join us online, on Facebook, on Instagram. Be so kind to share the message. Let them know you're located that you are at Become Church. And share the message to someone. It's so much stuff being shared on social media. Why not share the word? Amen. Wednesday night, we're going through the book of Mark. We're almost finished. We're on Mark chapter 14. Join us Wednesday night on Zoom call. Download the Zoom app, 402-871-8321 at 8 p.m. God, you being God in our lives. And Lord, we pray for that we would be those examples of freedom 
not only in this house, but when we go out into the world. Father, we just say, Lord, bless this service, anoint it. We want to do your will. We need your presence. We want to be able to lay down every heavy weight and the sin that besets us. And we want to come into your glory. Take us out of ourselves as we worship you. Help us to focus in on what really matters, and that's you, because it's all about you. In Jesus' name. Come on, saints, in Jesus', in Jesus name. name. And in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. And amen. All Lord, right, so we're going to stand on our feet if you, if you can, and we're going to uh, worship the Lord with this. One of my favorite songs, it's, um, it talks about how good he is. Lord, you are good and your mercies endure forever. Um, raise your hand if you know that his mercies are new every morning. And yes, you depend Lord. on those mercies. Yes. So here we go. We're going to play this song now. And just um, worship the Lord with these words, with your hands, with however you want to worship him. Hallelujah. Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. People from every nation. People from every nation and tongue. From generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you for who you are. We worship you. Hallelujah, 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 we worship you. For who you are, you are good. Lord, you are good and you. Hallelujah. Here we go. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, we bless you. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. People from every nation. People, hallelujah. From generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you for who you are. We worship you, hallelujah, 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 we worship you, who you are, you are good, so good God, yes you are, yes you are, yes you are. You are good. You are good all the time, all the time. You are good. You are good all the time, all the time. Come on. You are good. Yes, you are, Lord. You are good all the time, all the time. You are good. You are good all the time, all the time, all the time. You are good. You are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Come on. 
Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Declare to him. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. People from every nation. People from every nation and tongue. From generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you for who you are. We worship you. Hallelujah, 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 we worship you. For who you are, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you. For who you are, we worship you. Hallelujah, 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 we worship you. For who you are, 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 you are. and you, you are, are good. good. Hey, hallelujah, Lord. We bless you. We praise you. Worthy is your name in all yes, the earth. God. Holy is your name, O oh God. We bless you. We thank you. Yes, we Lord. honor you, Lord. Hallelujah be to your name. Yes, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you for being Hallelujah. with us, Lord. Thank you that your mercies endure forever. Lord, thank you that you're good. Lord, we thank you that you are the great God, the great King above all gods. In your hands are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are yours also. The sea is yours, for you made it, and your hands form the dry ground. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture. We are the sheep of his hands. Hallelujah, Lord. We yes, love God. you. We thank you. We praise you, O oh God. Thank you, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. And he makes all things new, and we are moving forward in him. So we thank you, Lord, for this next one. We worship you, Lord God. We thank you for making all things new. Lord, we just surrender right now all the things that seem like they're dying or, or fading away, Lord God, all the things that we may have lost, Lord, uh, hope that we may have lost. Lord God, any hope deferred, we surrender it to you right now. In Jesus' name, God, any burdens, anything we don't understand, Lord, we surrender that to you right now.